uh, 1975 right here, from the neighborhood this evening. Uh, on my right is the man who's really the reason that I'm here this evening. It's my uncle, Henry Kaiser, who was one of my father's nine siblings, a graduate of the University of Wisconsin and Brooklyn Law School. And in 1944, he was in the U.S. He was a lieutenant in the U.S. Army. And in November of 1944, he was in Paris immediately after the liberation. <coughs> And Jacqueline and Christiane Bouache, who are two of the main characters in the book, along with their brother Andre Bouache, saw an advertisement in the newspaper seeking housing for U.S. Army officers because there was actually a housing shortage in Paris immediately after the liberation. And they took my uncle in rent free for a year in gratitude to the Allies. And my uncle had just gotten married and he wrote home to his new wife that he was living in a French apartment, Paris apartment, with two very attractive French girls. <laughs> and his wife wrote back, is there anyone else there? And he wrote back, yes, there's also a very attractive French maid. <laughs> I repeated this story to Christian in Paris three weeks ago, who's now only 91, but still remembers everything, which is the last line of the book. And she said, that's true, the maid was very attractive. <laughs> um, so he heard all the stories. They had been in the resistance at that moment and for the four years at that moment with their brother. And my uncle heard all the stories from them when they were fresh and I heard all the stories from him because they were the most exciting stories anybody had ever heard. Many near misses and exciting moments and tragic moments as well. But to their own children, after my uncle was there, they all got married quite rapidly and by uh, 1955, they had about eight children among them, but they never spoke about their experiences with their own children because what had happened was just too painful for them. And the silence continued for 50 years until finally the brother died and then Christian's sister died and in 1997 she was the last one left and she is above all a woman of duty and she realized that the story would die with her if she didn't uh, do something about it. So she called up her friend, <coughs> Claire Landelier, who is a professor at the Sorbonne and happens to be the daughter of André Postel Vinet, who happens to be the person who recruited André Bouache into the resistance at the end of 1940, and his daughter happens to be a professor specializing, no coincidence, in the resistance and in France under the occupation. So she provided Christian with a research assistant named Mathilde Demoiselle, and with Mathilde's help, <coughs> Christian produced 45 pages for her grandchildren. And that gave me an opening to ask her if she would cooperate with a longer book. And she said yes. And I sold the book, we moved to Paris, and I went to dinner at Christian's house the second or third night I was there. And she said, of course, you can't use our real names. And my heart sank. But she's a stubborn old Scorpio, and I'm a stubborn, slightly less old Scorpio. And I knew I wasn't going to turn her around right away. So I didn't say anything for nine months. And we were in the house in the country where she lived in Fontainebleau. And we had lunch. And after lunch, I said, you know, I can't really do this book if I can't use the real names. And she said, okay, but if there's a movie, you'll change the names. And I said, fine. <laughs> All right. And this, this is a picture you're supposed to see last, but this is actually me giving Christian a copy of the galley of the book last December in Paris. All right, so there's my uncle. These are the German street signs that were all over Paris, the humiliating Parisians. This is a uh, poster saying, French and German workers unite. One of the main reasons that the ex uh, resistance exploded in size in 1943 is that the Vichy government <coughs> kept uh, complying with German demands for slave labor, basically, of young Frenchmen. And in 1943, there was a decree that all young French men between the ages of 20 and 24 had to spend two years working in German factories. And that produced a 
avalanche of uh, Frenchmen going into the mountains and joining the Maquis rather than going over to Germany. And here we have at the top with the pipe is Andre Bouache, who is one of the stars of our story, and next to him, Andre Bradenet, just to his left, holding on to something on his left, who actually succeeds uh, Andre as de Gaulle's military delegate in occupied Paris in January of 1944. They were classmates at uh, this uh, very fancy university in 1936, and by coincidence they succeed each other as de Gaulle's representative in Paris. And this is the house and fountain below where the family patriarch, Jacques Bouache, There's Jacques. He keeps his job in the uh, Department of Public Works as the director of the Bureau of Highways. And he and his wife, Hélène, and their oldest son, Robert, do not join the resistance, while the three younger children do join the resistance, which causes a certain amount of tension, although Christiane always said that what they did by joining the resistance was because of the way they had been brought up by their parents. But one of the key factors in determining who went in and who went out and who did not was how old you were. And it was a lot easier at the age of 25 to risk everything. And, and the parents were both in their 50s when the war began. And I began in January of 1944 in Paris. It is a few minutes before four on a gray Paris afternoon when the black Citroën Traction Avant pulls up in front of a drab apartment building in the Rue de la Santé on the left bank. The low-slung front-wheel drive Citroën is famous as the getaway car for French gangsters, but now it has acquired a more menacing pedigree. It is the official automobile of the German secret police. Two Gestapo agents in black leather raincoats jump out onto the sidewalk. They pull a single prisoner, a short 20-year-old Frenchman named Jacques, out of the car after them. The youth's nearly limp body broadcasts defeat, but he shows no obvious marks of the beating. Two and a half miles away, a swastika sways atop the Eiffel Tower. It is the 1,308th day of the Nazi occupation of Paris. Dozens of other swastikas defile the French capital. Below them, street signs written in German punctuate the avenues with unfamiliar accents, humiliating Parisians at every carrefour. The city's best restaurants, like Maxime's, are still flourishing, but now their customers are mostly German officers and their young French companions. Starvation rations for the French have transformed apartment terraces into rabbit farms, as the urban dawn is oddly heralded by roosters. More fortunate Parisians rely upon the generosity of country cousins who have much more access to food. Daytime Paris echoes to the sound of shoes with wooden soles clip-clopping down its narrow streets and grand avenues. If an old pair of shoes needs a new sole, you can't do anything about it because there is no leather, said Pierre Mondes France. It's very difficult to describe a country where everyone spends all of their time looking for things. Only 7,000 cars circulate on the streets of the City of Light, many of them converted to run on wood. They are called gazogen. Two million bicycles are the best way to get around above ground, but a good bicycle can cost 10,000 francs, almost as much as a car did before the war. The only taxis are pedicabs pedaled by bicycle riders or a taxi hippomobile pulled by a single horse. The fastest pedicab is propelled by two veterans of the Tour de France. Bicycle power also keeps the movie theaters open. Four men pedaling a generator at 13 miles an hour for six hours can produce enough reliable electricity for two full shows. Jews and communists are the first victims of the occupation, but the dangers of resisting the Nazis are escalating for everyone. Huge yellow posters plastered on the walls of the metro proclaim that members of the resistance are no longer the only ones facing German firing squads. A new edict ordains their fathers, cousins, and in-laws will be executed as well. <clears throat> and yet, in January of 1944, there is a new uncertainty bubbling underneath the humid winter air. All across Nazi Europe, the occupied are buoyed and the occupiers menaced by the event that everyone knows is coming, but no one knows exactly when or where, the Allied invasion of the Nazi-ruled continent. Across the English Channel, massive numbers of British, American, Canadian, and French troops are gathering on the southern coast of England 
where Dwight Eisenhower is making plans for a spectacular invasion of France. Thanks to a huge disinformation campaign, its location remains a secret six months before the assault begins. Yesterday, the young prisoner accompanying his German captors was a proud member of the French resistance. Today, he is leading the German agents to the secret address he had sworn to conceal so they can arrest his boss, André Bouloche, a man he worships. If André is really there, the Germans have promised Jacques he will be rewarded with his freedom. But should he believe that? Jacques is young looking even for his age, especially today he looks almost like a little boy. He's joined the resistance just three months earlier after being recruited by his Sorbonne classmate André's sister, Christiane. Christiane has no trouble persuading him to join up. When she asks him if he wants to work for her brother, he signs up immediately without hesitation or reflection. Jacques is the same age as Christiane who turned 20 at the end of 1943. Christiane is smart, strong, and attractive. Her clandestine duties require her to ride her bicycle all over Paris, sometimes as much as 60 miles a day. She picks up telegrams from secret drop-off points, codes and decodes them, transports forbidden radio equipment, and sometimes smuggles guns through the capital, usually in a basket, underneath eggs or vegetables. All Bouloches share an innate sense of duty when Christiane returns from the countryside after the armistice to find German soldiers goose-stepping through Paris, she is consumed by a single thought. This is wrong. Before the war started, she had been certain we wouldn't just resist them, we would beat them. That's why the occupation was a thunderclap. Coupled with youthful fearlessness and hero worship of her brother, that simple notion, this is wrong, propels her into the underground fight against the Germans. She is hypnotized and horrified by the occupation. It swallows all of her attention. The Bosch sisters' first act of resistance occurs when they are stopped by two German soldiers on the Avenue du Président Wilson. When the young Germans ask for directions to the Place de la Concorde, the girls, girls cheerfully dispatch them in the opposite direction. There is no heat at her lycée, and Christiane wears gloves to turn the pages of the classroom dictionary. She is upset when one of her Jewish teachers loses her job, but she does not consider the plights of the Jews to be the most important thing. More than anything else, it is instinctive patriotism that pushes her into battle. When the Germans are finally driven out of France, everyone's nightmare will be over, or so she believes. As 1944 begins, her brother, André François Roger Jacques Boulache, has been back in France for only four months. He is an engineer, a lawyer, and something of an adventurer. He and his sisters come from many generations of Catholic judges and prominent civil servants. Iconoclism is a leitmotif in their family. Four months earlier, in the second week of September 43, André is taken off from England under a nearly full moon with seven other passengers and a single-engine Westland Lysander. Many underground fighters are parachuted into occupied France, but the plane carrying this group touches down on a secret airstrip in the Loire Valley. These landings are dangerous because there's always the possibility the Germans have been tipped off. André is a handsome 28-year-old with brown hair and thick eyebrows that hover over a permanent glint in his eye. Nearly six feet tall, he walks with a tempered, youthful swagger. Before the war, he was considered something of a dandy. André has been ordered back to occupied France by Charles de Gaulle to be the general's personal military delegate in Paris. Pseudonym Armand, codename Hippotenuse, André's charge from the renegade general is to bring some order to the burgeoning resistance movements now operating in 11 different departments in northern France. In September 43, after a nine-month absence, André is returned to France on that Lysander, carrying 500,000 francs in cash. Like everyone in the resistance arriving from England, he also carries a cyanide pill in his pants pocket. It will be there always unless he is arrested. When he touches it with his index finger, it feels like insurance against torture, or perhaps like his destiny. Either way, he knows he will swallow it if he is captured by the Germans. A certain fatalism fuels André's fearlessness. I never felt the slightest hesitation on his part, said his sister Christiane. Now in January 44, André is inside the secret apartment on the top floor of an apartment building on the left bank. With him are his right hand, Charles Gampel, and his assistant Genevieve. Because their junior aide, Jacques, has been absent for only a day, neither Boulash nor Gampel suspects that he has been arrested. They certainly haven't imagined that Jacques has violated the cardinal principle of the resistance. No matter how badly you are tortured, 
You must try with all your might not to divulge anything important for 48 hours after your arrest. After you have been missing for two days, your comrades are supposed to assume you have been arrested and relocate immediately to a new clandestine location. Only then, after the captured agent has endured two days of unimaginable affliction, is he authorized to tell everything he knows. If the system works the way it's supposed to, by then his information should be largely worthless anyway. Jacques adores his boss, but almost immediately after he's grabbed by the Germans, the young agent realizes he will never be able to remain silent. He sees only one way out. In a small cell with another Frenchman, he whispers, strangle me so that I won't talk. If you don't, I will tell them everything. But the boy's cellmate is incapable of providing such grisly mercy. Soon after, the young Sorbonne student begins to give up all of his secrets, including the location of Andre's secret apartment. Barely an hour later, Jacques is squeezing into the narrow elevator in the apartment house on the Rue de la Santé on the left bank with two Gestapo agents. When it reaches the fifth floor, the three men exit silently onto the landing. Jacques has been brought here to perform the secret knock. The young Frenchman points at the door of the doomed apartment, then walks toward it to carry out the sordid duty. One sharp rap of his fist, a beat, then two softer knocks on the door. Inside the apartment, Andre recognizes the cloak and dagger sequence and stands up from his desk to acknowledge it. When he opens the door, he sees two Germans in black leather raincoats pointing identical Walter PPK pistols at his heart. Hands up, they shout. What's going on? Andre screams back. Instinct propels the Frenchman toward the staircase as the Germans open fire. Two bullets strike the resistance fighter just below the chest. One agent rushes towards him to check for a weapon as the other one storms the apartment to capture his Confederates. If he had not been wounded, Andre thinks this part would have been easy. He would have swallowed the fatal pill right away. But now he is writhing on the floor with blood spurting out of his stomach and the cyanide never leaves his pocket. For a very long time, he will wonder whether this has been the right decision. For just one hour, the Gestapo leave the secret apartment unoccupied and unwatched. Forty-five minutes have passed since the first German team has departed with Andre and his betrayer. Now Jacqueline, Andre's sister and confederate, is at the apartment's front door. She's there to make dinner for everyone because, naturally, the women are expected to cook. In pre-war France, women don't even have the right to vote, and privilege de Gaulle will finally bestow upon them after the liberation. Jacqueline performs the secret knock. Hearing no answer, she lets herself in with her own key. At first, the empty apartment does not make her anxious. Gradually, she senses a certain disarray, but if there is blood on the floor of the hallway, she has not noticed it. She walks into the kitchen and begins to peel some potatoes, then she strikes a match to light a fire beneath them. Suddenly, she realizes she is missing a vital part of the meal. One immutable fact of Paris life has not been altered by the Nazi occupation. Frenchmen still require wine with their dinner. So Jacqueline leaves the potatoes simmering, skips the elevator, bounces down five flights of stairs to the street, walks around the corner to the neighborhood Epicelie, and buys a few more groceries and the vital bottle of Vin Rouge. She will always remember this as the best timed shopping trip of her life. <laughs> when she returns to the apartment house, she notices something out front that had not been there four minutes earlier, another black Citroën Traction Avant. Jacqueline tiptoes into the apartment house. The passengers in the car have just closed the door of the elevator behind them. Now it is only one floor above her. Her body stiffens as she watches the wooden cabin rise slowly through the narrow open shaft. Second, third, fourth, finally, it stops at the fifth floor where her potatoes are cooking. Later, she will wonder what the Gestapo men think when they see her potatoes. Right now, she is already sprinting towards the metro. I have to save my sister. That is her only thought. Most of the time, Jacqueline and Christiane don't tell each other where they will be during the day. But today, Jacqueline happens to know that her sister has taken the afternoon off to listen to some Bach at the Palais de Chaillot. But the concert hall is on the right bank at Trocadero, 14 metro stops away. Jacqueline sprints 800 yards to the Metro Glacier. She's out of breath when she reaches the platform just as the train Direction Etoile pulls into the station. The doors close behind her and the trip seems to take forever. D'Enfer Rochelot, Las Pai, Montparnasse, Pasteur, still seven more stops to go. Jacqueline is not religious, but she is praying anyway, praying she will somehow be able to inter intercept her sister before she returns to the secret apartment 
where the second wave of the Gestapo is now waiting to capture both of them. But can she possibly get there before the concert ends? And even if she does, how will she ever be able to snatch her sister out of the crowd? She has no idea where Christiane is sitting, and the Palais de Chaillot is one of the largest concert halls in Paris. Now the train is rumbling out of its underground tunnel to travel over the Seine de Passy, just one more stop to go, then it dives back underground to pull into Trocadero. Jacqueline knows every inch of this station, it is the one she grew up with. She runs toward the exit for the Palais de Chaillot, now she is dashing past the statues of Apollo and Hercules still carrying her groceries. As she enters the lobby, she can just make out the sounds of Bach still seeping out of the hall. I haven't missed the end of the performance, but how will she ever be able to snatch Christian out of the crowd? Happy accident or intuition, to the end of her life, Christian will never be able to answer that question. Before today, she knows she has never left a concert early, but this afternoon, something suddenly makes her stand up to leave the hall 10 minutes before the concert has ended. When she reaches the empty lobby, she walks straight into the arms of her frantic sister. We can't leave by the front door. That is Jacqueline's only greeting. She thinks the Gestapo may have followed her here. Deciding they have nothing left to lose, they approach the box office. Jacqueline tells the ticket seller she must speak to the manager. He may betray them, but they see no other choice. When the manager appears, Jacqueline exclaims, we can't leave by the front door, nothing more. The manager looks at her silently, his face revealing nothing, now he will save them or turn them over to the Germans. He turns around and walks out of the box office. Then he leads the terrified, but still very attractive young women to the stage door. Jacqueline repays his kindness by thrusting the groceries and the bottle of wine she has carried halfway across Paris into his hands. They will only slow them down now anyway. Outside, they scour the street for Gestapo men, but no one looks particularly menacing. Thank you very much. Christiane and Jacqueline survived the war, although uh, Christiane has uh, many other uh, close calls, including on the way to another, another apartment where the uh, Gestapo is waiting for her six months later, and she's on a bicycle, and she gets a flat tire, and because she's getting a flat tire, she's gotten a flat tire, she walks the bicycle, and because she's walking the bicycle, her aunt's maid, who has been sent down into the street to warn her not to go back, spots her and prevents her a hundred yards from the apartment from going into it. Uh, the book is full of that sort of thing. Anyway, I hope you'll have uh, some questions. Yes, sir? Will there be a movie and will you use the correct name? <laughs> <laughs> I certainly hope. We're trying very hard to make a movie and I think Christiane has come around and now will allow the correct names. Yes. She seems to have changed her attitude a little bit as she's gotten older. The way I did the research was I moved to Paris, I interviewed Christian, I interviewed the uh, guy who recruited them into the resistance, I interviewed all of their offspring, and then I made two terrific archival discoveries. I learned that the French government had commissioned an oral history of the resistance immediately after World War II, and they interviewed everyone they could find who'd been in the resistance, and this was indexed in such a way that I could find all of the uh, interviews in which the Bouboche family was mentioned. And then I realized that British intelligence must have interviewed Andre and his deputy Charles Gampel and Alex Katlama, who arrives in Paris in 1944 and falls in love with Jacqueline. And if you went to England during the war and said that you were a member of the French resistance, the first thing that happened was you had to go to patriotic school, which had been set up by MI5 in the countryside. It sort of looked like a private club in London at a library. After you've been there a couple days, they begin to interview you four hours in the morning and four hours in the afternoon. And to figure out if you were a goat or a sheep, a goat meant that you were the real deal, a true supporter of the Allies, and a sheep meant that you were a double agent working for the Germans. You had to tell <clears throat> your interviewer everything that you had done during the war up to that point in two different ways, first chronologically and then thematically. So I called up the uh, National Archives in London from Paris, and I said I was looking for Andre Bouache's file, and the first guy said, I don't 
know where that would be, but Peter might know, and he switched me over to Peter, and Peter said, I don't know where that would be, but I think John will definitely know. And John said, yep, Andre Bouache, AJ74628, if you can prove that he's dead, we will make his secret file public. So I got his file and two other files, and that was incredibly helpful because I got first Andre's minute-by-minute -minute description of what he'd done during the first two years of the war, and then I also got what he did, how well he did when he was being trained to be a saboteur, how good a marksman he was, how good he was at making bombs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes, ma'am. Why didn't they tell their want to talk about it with their children? Because what you'll find out when you read the book is uh, because of what they did, uh, members of their family who had not been in the resistance were shipped off on the last train to Germany and they all died in the camps. Mm -hmm. So there was an element of guilt, especially on the part of Andre, who after the war comes back, becomes a socialist politician, becomes Minister of Education for de Gaulle, but devotes most of his public life, having survived three German concentration camps, Auschwitz, Birkenau, and Flossenburg, he devotes the rest of his life to reconciliation between France and Germany so that no one would ever experience what he had experienced. Sir? I have read that there's been this huge silence on this topic because so many of the French did collaborate and it was very morally murky among them as to those who survived and how they survived. It is, as uh, Adam Gottnick said, still the subject that can ruin any Paris dinner party if you bring it up. <laughs> uh, I don't think there was a huge number who collaborated. I believe there was a very small number who actively resisted and a very small number who actively collaborated and the vast majority uh, tried to get enough to eat. Uh, and also, as uh, Claire Andrea explained to me, the historian who was somewhat helpful to me, even the categories of collaborator and resistor aren't, don't really work because the same person could be doing both. If you were a senior executive at the uh, French National Railroads, part of the time you were keeping the trains running and part of the time you were telling the Allies where to blow the trains up. Uh, on the other hand, if you were an Allied airman, according to a statistic of the American Intelligence Service, and you were shot down and you knocked on the door of a French farmer, 99% of the time the French farmer would take you in rather than uh, turning you over to the Germans. This is a very, it's a, it's a touchy subject to me because Americans generally assume that we would have behaved very differently than the French did, and I'm not sure that that's true. But for me, the most important quote on this subject comes from Anthony Eden, the former foreign minister and the former prime minister of England, who is a key figure in the best film about this subject, The Sorrow and the Pity, which is an incredibly important documentary made in 1971 by Marcel Ophuls, who I had the honor of interviewing while I was doing the research. But in it, O'Fool says to Anthony Eden, you don't seem to be very hard on the French. You're not judging them very harshly. And Eden says, no, I'm not judging them harshly because those who have not lived in an occupied country must never judge those who have. And I think that's one of the most important lessons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you think that Eichmann then was just suffering from the banality of evil? No, I don't think there was anything banal about what Eichmann did. No, I don't. I do not. Yes, ma'am. Um, I just finished the biography of Virginia Hall, and um, I'm curious as to whether the man who parachuted in was one of the people who she helped guide in. I don't know the answer to that question. I'm sorry. <laughs> He didn't parachute in, he landed in a secret airstrip. Okay. I mean, I'm a bit of a scholar on the subject, but I guess I don't know this. Um, you know, I guess England slept during Nazi Germany, but did, did France sleep as well? Oh, they were both, well, sure, they were equally bad. I have a long section describing exactly what they did and did not do, and how the effects of, well, the worst effect of World War I, where they suffered millions and millions of casualties, like one in seven Frenchmen was dead, killed, or missing in action in the French army in World War I. And this produces this terrible paralysis in the 1930s when Hitler is coming to power and when they miss opportunities over and over again to rein Hitler in. And of course the worst, this all culminates with the French Prime Minister and the British Prime Minister making the deal at Munich which allows uh, Czechoslovakia to be 
divided up. And one of the last things, in fact, that I added was, let's see if I can find this. After Munich, well, it's a fabulous speech by Churchill in which he describes how they've allowed all of this to develop and how catastrophic their uh, inaction was. Mm -hmm. Here we go, here we go. I'll just read you a paragraph or two. This is right after the Munich Agreement. All in, this is Churchill speaking in the House of Commons. All is over, silent, mournful, abandoned, broken. Czechoslovakia recedes into the darkness. Not only are they politically mutilated, but economically and financially they are in complete confusion. When I think of the fair hopes of a long peace which still lay before Europe at the beginning of 1933, when Herr Hitler first obtained power, and of all the opportunities of arresting the growth of Nazi power which have been thrown away, when I think of the immense combinations and resources which have been neglected or squandered, I cannot believe a parallel exists in the whole course of history. We are in the presence of a disaster of the first magnitude which has befallen Great Britain and France. Do not let us blind ourselves to that. It must now be accepted that all the countries of Central and Eastern Europe will make the best terms they can with the triumphant Nazi power. The system of alliances in Central Europe upon which France has relied for her safety has been swept away, and I can see no means by which it can be reconstituted. The road down the Danube Valley to the Black Sea, the road which leads as far as Turkey, has been opened. Many people, no doubt, honestly believe that they are only giving away the interests of Czechoslovakia, whereas I fear we shall find that we have deeply compromised and perhaps fatally endangered the safety and even the independence of Great Britain and France. Do not suppose this is the end. This is the only the beginning of the reckoning. This is only the first sip, the first foretaste of a bitter cup which will be proffered to us year by year unless by a supreme recovery of moral health and martial vigor we arise again and take our stand for freedom as in the olden time. Well, that, of course, did eventually happen, but it took a long time. And one of the things Churchill does, by the way, as the Germans are invading France, is he proposes a merger of Great Britain and France to the French government, which Pétain leads the opposition to, and which one French minister says, well, better to be a province of Germany than to be a partner of Great Britain. <laughs> did you read The, uh, the Gathering Storm about Hitler's? Yes, yes, of yeah. course, yeah. First on the, on the sorrow and the pity, my recollection is um, that the, in that s those small towns, the resistance fighters said that they were completely, um, uh, afterwards, uh, completely uh, ignored and considered outcasts. Uh, they were communists, and the rest of the people in the town mistrusted them for being in part of the resistance. They weren't heroes. At all. Well, it was a very mixed bag. It depended on where you were, but certainly that was one of the reactions. And yeah. the other thing is the great quote that Churchill uh, made, which is, uh, uh, you have had a choice between um, war and dishonor. You have chosen dishonor, and you shall have war. Right, yes. But there were a few, like the subjects of my book, who in fact chose honor and risked everything for the honor of France. One more question. Yes. It's two questions. <laughs> what was the biggest surprise you came across in doing your research? And number two, having been through this, what are you, do you want to do next? <laughs> uh, the first, uh, the answer to the first question is that after all of the archival research that I did in the French archives and the British archives, uh, I think the biggest surprise was that everything that Christian had told me turned out to be absolutely accurate and all the archival stuff elaborated upon and confirmed what she told me. And that my next project is going to be a big book about New York City since 
1970, which is a couple of years after I moved there, and I'm not going to say anything more about it because I've discovered that one can talk about a book or write a book, but one rarely does both. <laughs> all right, thank you all very much for coming.